Now, a lot of you can't afford a big deer parcel. And, and let's face it, you know, acres just keep going up. Um, and they go up reflective of uh, your salary. Salary levels are going up a lot slower than actual the cost per acre. So someone's buying ability of X amount of acres has been reduced over time. It's the way, that's the way it's worked. Um, looked at back in the day, someone's salary to buy an average 40 acre parcel, it was half their salary, just someone working at General Motors. And I'm not saying the General Motors working in the plant, that's where my dad worked for 34 years and uh, he retired from there. But his salary went up over time, of course, and, and what he made, he was hourly, he worked in the plant, plant 15 in Pontiac Motors. His salary, when he first started, he could probably buy a 40 acres for about half a salary on a yearly basis. Now that's changed significantly. In a lot of areas, you're looking at several times your annual salary to cost for the cost of buying a 40 acre parcel. What I like to do, and we look at about half our parcel sizes on a given year, might be 50, 60 acres or less, and, and then our average might be 100 acres. And we look at a lot of parcels that are three, four, 600 acres, 500. Dylan said he's going to Maryland. He's looking at an 800 acre parcel pretty soon. Kevin Smith in Ohio is looking at a parcel, I believe it was down in Arkansas, that's 1,200 acres. He talked to someone that was similar size in Pennsylvania recently. So we look at a lot of these larger parcels and that brings up the average. But what we're trying to do is make your parcel size grow without you having to buy more acres. And that's something that's easy to do. We look at the flip side a lot. Um, number five down here, there are a whole lot of people out there that make 500 acres look like 50 acres. And it's by doing the opposite of all these right here. There's a lot of people that go buy a thousand acres. Not a lot because they can't afford it, but there are a lot of people that go there, a high percentage of those people, let's put it that way, that go buy a large parcel because they need to, because they're not getting near the most out of their parcel. They're making a thousand acres look like it's a hundred acres. A hunt's like a hundred acres. We want to reverse that. We want you to take 40 acres, make it look like a hunt's 400. I like 400 acre parcel or, or larger without buying more land, of course. Number one, everything should be screened. A lot of the problems is you look at an open uh, river bottom area. I've been to a parcel where it's 200 acres and it was a large portion of river bottom with big mature timber and you could see across a half mile river bottom where it was open from one side to the other the end of the winter. Those deer have nothing to hold on to. They run through that fast. They're through that in 20 seconds, 25 seconds, a half a minute. They're already through the property and they have one disturbance in there. Their smell 100 set and they're off the property. So there's 200 acres. I've been to a 160 acre parcel in Michigan where it took longer to, to snowshoe into the parcel because of the easement to get into it than it did to actually look at the land because it was 155 acres that we could see all at one time standing on a knoll in the middle of the parcel. Those kind of parcels seem very, very tiny because you can see every square inch of it and you don't have screening. What should be screened? We talk about screening everything. I used to have when I gave a lot of talks and habitat seminars back in the day, we're talking early 2000s, mid 2000s. I had a transparency, you know, this is before I even had a PowerPoint presentation or a tablet or anything um, or a projector. This is literally bought a transparency, a projector, made transparencies and in that time I had one that we talked about you'd screen everything and meaning you screen your food plots should be screened your bedding area should be screened your access should be screened where water holes are should be screened you want to give deer a level of security in those areas their travel corridors where they travel you can't expect them just to go right through the middle of the woods it was interesting because I've been on parcels where they they looked at back in the day they they put cover over the top of a deer travel corridor through a hardwoods with small whips and saplings with the thought that the deer would just walk right through that like a tunnel. Well, all those leaves are gone and they're just little sticks making that, that tunnel and it wasn't enough to attract deer to actually walk through there because it wasn't screened. You could still see 200 yards in every direction. We've seen bedding areas like that. Bedding areas that are create more of a, they're created by making more of a trampoline effect where deer are under that bedding cover and they can still see 150, 200 yards in any direction. That makes a 40 acre parcel look really, really tiny, let alone a 500 acre parcel doing the same thing. So screening, make sure that deer can't see past that next line. And if you're just focusing on your access, the edges of your property, food plots, bedding areas, water holes, deer travel corridors, you can imagine there's a lot of screens starting to take place on your property and all those screens start to slow down deer and the next thing that really slows down deer is 
you're taking, okay, this area should be a bedding area. We're cutting that down. And, and you're making this so that your bedding areas should always be bedding areas. Your food sources should always be food, food sources. You're not relocating these as the years progress because you're cutting more here over here. Your bedding area should have a lot amount of uh, high amount of diversity, should have a lot more sunlight hitting to the ground. They're usually smaller in nature, one, two acres, half acre, quarter acre, depending on the size of the parcel. And that's where you add diversity. If you have hardwood regeneration, you're adding conifers. If you have conifers, you're taking conifers out and adding woody regeneration, trees, briars that are going to come into the inside of those, those bedding areas. The bottom line is you're creating a lot of diversity within there. Then you have your general timber strand improvement. When you have tops on the ground, that's why you never chip your tops, never take your tops out of the out of the property that you have. You want those to screen deer from deer, from deer from hunters, and that's called side cover. Side cover is critical. It's, you know, overhead cover doesn't mean anything. Side cover, where there's hardwood regeneration, logs, tops, hills, debris from logging, that's all screening deer from deer and deer from hunters. That side cover is critical and it also just in the act of logging your property creates diversity. It creates, you put tops on the ground, it breaks up the woods and deer can't see. Number three, limited hunting pressure with smart hunting. So obviously you're moving about the land without spooking deer. You don't want to spook deer in bedding areas. You don't want to spook them on food sources anywhere. You want to give the deer the impression that this is a sanctuary to them until you actually shoot one of them. So until that time though, you're looking at this is a sanctuary. You're trying to advance a lot of bucks to the next age class. You're making your deer seem, your property seem smaller because you're saying when it's a bad day to hunt, it's really windy, it's really warm, you're gonna leave scent on the ground, low percentage chance you're gonna shoot something, you're just simply not going hunting. The more you really push it and press it to get on the woods, out in the woods, and hunt times that aren't necessarily appropriate to hunt, then you're drastically hurting yourself and your potential for the land. And we can go again, you know, one of the factors I don't list here is when you have too many deer, when you have too many does and fawns on your land, when you're creating a fawning a deer factory, doe factory, where you actually have lots of does and fawns on your property, that makes your property seem a lot smaller too because you have excess number of deer, they're taking up space. And that's another factor, but that's another strategy too. You're limiting your hunting pressure. You're making sure you get on and off the property without spooking deer. And of course, if you have too many deer, you can't do that. You're choosing the best days. I highly encourage you to check out HuntWise. That's my algorithm infused into their hunting weather forecast and algorithm. It's the best on the, on the uh, internet. The best app out there for predicting when you should get in the woods to hunt. It's based purely on the weather. And then of course, increasing the diversity. And then again, adding conifers to your bedding areas, having switchgrass in your, in your uh, screening areas, making sure that your property doesn't look like a monoculture of hardwood. The more it looks like a monoculture of anything, the more you don't obviously have screening letter, layers. And let's face it, not only screening layers, but whitetails are creatures of edge. So the more changes in habitat you have from one to the next, the more you can count on not only deer being attracted, attracted to your land, but deer follow edges, whether it's timber cut changes, travel corridors, outside edges of food plots, they follow edge, they're creatures of edge. You can look over a large aerial photo of thousands of acres of public land, and because it's such a monoculture, you can really narrow it down to deer should be traveling there, 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 and if they're remote, if in remote locations, you can find those spots pretty quick. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there that make 500 acres look like 50. You just do the opposite of all these right here. Big open hardwoods. Around here we have managed forest on private land by government state agencies that really take more of a monoculture look at managing the forest for timber production and high dollars. We have a lot of just straight corn and bean rotations and ag land. You don't have that screening around there. And so someone needs a thousand acres sometimes to make it seem and make it hunt like they're hunting a hundred acres. We want to switch that around. You can do that this year. A lot of the changes we talk about making and forecasting right now, and that's what we talk about designing your land, nocturnal deer parcels right now. What can you can do to change that quick habitat, deer habitat fixes on your land this year, right now, how to fix nocturnal parcels? Because there's so much you can do right now. We're, we're shooting this on March 21st. So there's a lot you can plan going into this year. And again, 
you know, Dylan and I, our schedules are full um, through September. We already have all our clients booked, deposited. And so we're booked out. We'll start booking for next year, more like mid-summer, late summer. But we have Kevin Smith out in Pennsylvania, Ohio. We have Joe Youngblood in, Ohio, in Michigan, east side of uh, Wisconsin. We, you can still get them on their books. In fact, Joe just started booking clients a week ago, a week and a half ago. He's already has about 10 clients. I think Kevin's been booking for about five, six weeks. He's got about 30 clients. Fly-ins too. They'll both go to fly-ins anywhere in the country a whitetail is. And that's under the supervision of Dylan and I. So we've created a structure where we can help as many people as possible. We look forward to helping you. And hey, if you never want to hire us, just follow the videos. Keep following what we talk about online. We'll kind of try to keep bringing them to you. Um, I need to go. Dylan's giving me the sign that I already went over my limit on this one. So... <laughs> We got more to do. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> he does it tactfully, by the way. It's not like this big angry face in the background. I wish we could have a camera on him sometimes. He's very, he's very, uh, very respectful and very nice. You know, <laughs> he's very considerate of, I just of what need, we do. Like that soundtrack to play, like from like the Oscars when you go over like, your time. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just start playing. Oh, <laughs> gotta go. <laughs> but anyways. We have fun doing this. We talk about a lot of other things be besides videos and doing that. And, and sometimes we go a little bit long. But bottom line is a lot of times we strategize. This is a video idea that Dylan thought we should do on. We've touched on this in a lot of areas where you can make a large parcel look very small. You can make a small parcel very large. But we haven't touched on this topic just as a whole for a video. And we're always trying to explain things and come up with different ways to teach you so that you can get it right and do it right this year again this can happen very fast and we want to see you turn your hunting around this season and beyond again it doesn't take a lot of time you can do it right now folks i want to make sure you check out my web class video series whether it's how to design your food plot program or how to design your property in general and we have a new one coming out that'll be how to hunt the rut but these bucks back here are testament some of these bucks go back to 93 they're even in different states I urge you to check out those web classes that you can help yourself, help your land, help your hunt. The link is in the description. And also for those that have tried them out, I encourage you to offer some feedback in the comments below. Thank you.